I'm Nicholas Penrake and you're listening to A Trader's Life, the podcast where I get to talk to successful traders about their approach to trading, how they started out and went from broke or breaking even to pulling in thousands of dollars a week. Trading is a tough game. They say only around 5% of those who try actually make a profit. Join me for A Trader's Life to glean some valuable insights from the market wizards I get to talk to. For episode 13, I got together with Francis Hunt, trader, technical analyst, and teacher. Francis sees himself as a sniper, patiently waiting for the big trades. While he delights in causing controversy, he's also passionate about helping new and -and up-and-coming traders improve their edge. He's built a community of like-minded traders who support each other with trade ideas, peer review of setups, and positive reinforcement. This was a high-energy, entertaining episode, valuable trading insights dotted with vivid analogies, and Francis's own strongly held personal views on what and how to trade during the COVID troubling months ahead. It may be a bit longer than most conversations I have here, but in my view, I think it earns its length. Hey Francis, how's it going for you today? You're in Cyprus, right? Uh, Nicholas, yes indeed. Uh, I'm passing through the sunny aisle. Um, I tend to uh, keep keep my movements a little bit quiet because <laughs> it's interesting times, isn't it? But it's also hard to move with this CB19 stock narrative that has been uh, oh, yeah. unfurling. But yeah, currently on the island. Yeah, for sure. How long do you plan to be there? Um, generally, uh, I like to follow the sun, a uh, bit of a sunbird. Um, so I follow the sun. Typically, northern hemisphere winters, I prefer to be in the south. Um, and uh, as I was just before we we started, I was kind of describing my three circles that I think in. Um, I have the market sniper, which is traditional markets, oil, which I've been a trader for a very long time, long before the crypto markets came around. Um, forex, equities, um, traditional markets. Our biggest, most recent call was, you know, aggressively long gold in nineteen and short oil which we presented from the stage in Acapulco when we were delivering our presentation there, uh, which obviously in the beginning of this year uh, was an incredibly powerful one. So I tried to identify really big macro moves. I would describe myself as a global macro technical analyst. My choice for being that is there's, uh, I see that the world as this complex machine with pots of water being poured and spilled and dropped and pull a lever here and you tip some oil into a canister there and it flows. Uh, so I like to see the entirety of the machine rather than just peek through the keyhole and think I know what the room looks like. Um, and then rather than, say, follow the Fed and Fed statements and what's written and what people say, I like to see real evidence of movement in markets, macro shifting movements, big, key, prevailing trends um, show up in the charts. So that's how we were doing the gold versus oil analysis. And we said, man, this thing's going to flip badly. Uh, And hence our uh, positioning there. We were looking also then at oil equities. So I expressed those trades through all markets. We shorted planes, all American pipelines last year. We shorted tallow. We shorted a lot of things. And we were calling for sort of 85% market cap decimations, which is absurd and insane and usually provoked i like to provoke ridicule basically because that means i'm doing the right kind of work so i stand at that edge uh of that cliff and look everyone look for everyone to call me the fool uh because that means i'm being big out there uh and making the big call so that also means we're inaccurate fairly often but you only actually be, need to be uh, accurate once or twice for the scale of the moves that occurred on oil. We called for single digit oil when it was uh, it's sixty seven dollars. Little did I know that I was being conservative in the end, and I should have gone for zero or negative. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was no no. <laughs> yeah, you, you, didn't, you didn't see the pandemic coming. God, <laughs> wow. That's what I that's that's what I find about these things. I think far less things, and this is my my three circles that I was going back to the reset sniper. Um, actually, very few things are random and totally natural. I think we did see the pandemic coming, um, but we didn't know what it was we were calling, um, but we were calling an outlier event because we were also short uh, CCL, Carnival Cruise Lines, um, which I'm detecting a bit of a UK accent. You probably will know it if you're a FTSE 100 man. 
Um, and, you know, that spilt its guts awfully uh, as yeah. well. So we, we kind of called an event that said, hey, cruise liners are going to be stuffed for one or other reason. Pipeline companies are going to be stuffed for one or other reason. Oil companies are going to be properly stuffed. And by the way, we think oil is going to drop hugely relative to gold. We think you should be leveraged long gold and leverage short oil. Uh, and we were even going so far on oil against currency to go single digit. So that was a bit, that was one of those moments I like to remember because we were accurate. Don't please don't take that as a, a, an indication that we were always that much on the money. But that was sort of our nineteen into twenty best trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you ride gold up and then manage to sell off at the right moment this year? Uh, we did. Uh, we were fortunate there, and I'll tell you why. Again, it's, uh, I'm responsible for creating a bespoke uh, technical trading method. So when I say technical, I'm not just sitting there on the global macro big time frame charts and throwing moving averages or doing what most technical analysts do. I'm utilizing one particular uh, methodology that we feel has given us a true edge. And we even have a community that is entirely set up around that, uh, that, it, that we look at it. And it's called the Hunt Volatility Funnel Setup and Methodology. And basically, we're very, very interested in uh, volatility-based squeezes, technically. The reason for that is uh, just fun, just in terms of trading, which we all are, uh, although I wouldn't say we're nine screens day trading, jumping in every hour and back out again. We're more the big, big you know, money made in the sitting. Don't make the brokers unnecessarily rich. Look after yourself. Um, and uh, with that view, we typically look for those pinches because that allows you when to have very tight stop loss to exploit uh, leverage, which you truly have to earn the right to leverage. Most people should have an investment foundation first before they start light leverage. And I'm talking like 2x light leverage and 3x. Yeah. And then slowly they should have what we call a hot pot where they can then extend into leverages that are a bit higher. Um, and then you really need to be precise on your timing. And you also have to have your hypothesis confirmed by the market take you in. So we don't enter on market orders. We identify when there's the, the pinch is ending and when the expansion of volatility starts to take place. And we look for that market then to move to self-confirm. And this clears out a lot of incorrect views without it costing you anything as well. So as I stress, with the huge rewards to uh, risk multiples we get, you will be inaccurate often. Um, but as a trading strategy, I much prefer uh, if you switch to the, dive, the opposite is a scalper who's winning 99% of his trades and he's taking 10, 20 pips with a stop of about 1,500 pips. At the end of the month, he thinks he's done famously as another great month where largely he's right, he's not triggered his stop, and then he can have in one month a major move go against him and he can lose everything. I'd rather be the, that guy that's on the other side that's actually looking for substantial moves. And when you have as many markets as we do and so many so many um, machinations of state and dark state, dare I say, uh, without getting too conspiratorial on you, um, there's always something that's constricting and, late and preparing to spill in this highly perverted, overly tampered with, um, not really free market that we exist in. Everyone thinks it's capitalism and uh, it's kind of a cronyism in my view. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. How do you identify these pinches, as you call them, in volatility? What, was that the right term, pinches, you said? Yes, yeah, no, that's yeah. well put. Well, um, if I were just giving uh, general advice to people that weren't, you know, I don't want to join your community, just give me something useful. You know, a simple Bollinger Band uh, on a big time frame thrown down will highlight and train your eyes to identify these. We, um, you can also, there's certain pattern scanners that you can use certain spread betters. Uh, again, I'll use a UK example because uh, I think I've um, put, geolocated you there. Yeah, um, is yep. CMC, oh, very nice. Uh, CMC uh, markets, for example, IG. They will have pattern scanners for um, wedges and triangles. Now, those are traditional technical analysis patterns, but that'll get you in the kicking area of where things are constricting. But don't do it on five-minute and 15-minute charts because then you're scratching around. Yeah, look for the big time frames uh, on that. So are, are these pattern scanners like um, indicators? Is that right? Uh, what you would essentially do is you'll click which markets you're interested in 
Um, if I'm thinking of, say, the CMC one, you would go on there and you would say uh, all markets, or you can go, you know, metals only, for example, or, or commodities only, or FX only, or equities only, um, all markets, and then you would elect a certain pattern. And then you can have all time frames. I would reduce that to the bigger time frames. Um, it's like a tick box scan, and then you just hit enter, and then it generates a list. Um, I started there. There's a lot more sophisticated and a lot more sharper tools, but I'm just saying, you know, for somebody who doesn't want to spend anything and just wants to kick the tires and have a look around, um, if I was starting all over again um, and I didn't have a penny to my name, that's where I'd start. Yeah. Talk about uh, beginnings. H how did you get into trading in the first place? What was your background? Yes. So uh, I was a, I was sort of a cognizant aware that you know, wealth building was very important to me generally. And I had the laziness and impatience of admiring the fact of leveraged returns sitting in South Africa, hearing about huge bonuses being paid in London. Uh, I lived many years in London as well, like yourself and the city bankers. I thought, well, I'd like to be that. Um, and then my parents were actively engaged. Uh, my mum had inherited some money and she had it all in uh, local unit trusts, they were called Guard Bank and Old Mutual, which is also in the UK now. Um, they were sort of South Africans version of uh, assurance and insurance companies, so life as well as investment. And uh, they were just kept going up during the 80s. And I was in a, I was, I, we had military conscription then, and I was going in in August 87. And I had an aunt who died in Northampton who didn't uh, have any uh, heirs and get, uh, distributed to to nieces and nephews. And I was one, so I was lucky. So I got a, a you know a little bit of a disbursement of her estate. Uh, and I put the job lot in the markets because I kept listening to my parents who were checking the newspaper because that's what we did in those old days in the 80s yep. about how God Bank was back up again and Old Mutual was back up. And they were just making money by just being net in and i thought well my old man jumps in his car and he drives all the way to pretoria from johannesburg a 45 kilometer round trip and they even carpooled during the petrol crisis you know and all of this to work a full day and they're making all of this money just by passively being in there i love the sound of this passive investment malarkey a whole bunch more so through inherent laziness easy money all the wrong things that brings people into trading so i was you know i was ticking each box <laughs> on, yeah. on the toxic list yeah if, if if we were to do that as a young man who wants to show status and impress people uh and i put the job lot in uh and i went in on august 87 into the army as i was required and then the october crash happened and that was the single biggest uh, percentage loss, and I don't think it's been beaten in a single day. In yeah. Now I think it was twenty-two percent or something ridiculous. Yeah, mad. Yeah. Uh, and by the end of the fall, I think it did. You know, it had lost thirty, thirty-five. Don't quote me. And uh, now it's, it's part of history for me. But uh, I ate red big time, um, and that actually made me more interested, not less uh, interested. But it was terrible timing, uh, and that was just okay, let's jump into the same game that's serving everybody else well with a very little understanding. Yeah. So that was the beginning. <laughs> yeah. And then you sort of taught yourself or you did certain courses. How did you progress from that? Well, at one point I bought a software package. This will make you chuckle. Um, from a, a gentleman who was selling um, uh, charting software, a locally made charting software. So it was a South African version. And believe it or not, he was still running on DOS. <laughs> right. It's uh, going back a bit. And yeah. then we had these 33.6 yeah. uh, kilobyte modems that would dial up through the phone and go. T -t 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 yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> like the fact sound. Yeah. And screech. And you'd tie up the phone line screeching and then you'd hear <laughs> as it updated the stocks. And literally it was a black screen with a white axis all jet black and he had two colors for moving averages red and green and otherwise it was just a white line uh, and that was i started to you know watch stocks and i was already interested in the concept of squeeze um it had already become clear to me that the best single-minded moves what i learned through repeated losses because i was terrible at losses and oversizing and greed reflex all of it bad 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 blue accounts up yeah countlessly um but kept coming back yeah what it was that um the best most single-minded emotionally easy moves 
occur when you have breakouts. And then I would start to kind of Stephen Covey-esque, begin with the end of mind. When do those best single-minded breakouts occur and what uh, the key question that I don't think everybody else always remembers to ask is what happens to just precede that? Right. Because you need to be in before, not after. You can't be one of the guys chasing in no. because you could just be unlucky. Even with small, moderate volatility, when things are moving fast, you get shaken out where there's leverage involved. And that's, that initial question led to the entire development of an entire wall of theory and content that now spans probably by the time I finish recording the advanced section, it's going to be you know 50 or 60 hours. Uh, of all that we learn um, with geometry and various other aspects and all the additional information that charting gives you. And I am completely on the other spectrum of people that think it's random and that technical analysis is useless. I think the more you dig and the better the tools, and of course there's a lot of bad tools that have to be set aside um, because there's a lot of businesses that have set up just to sell picks and shovels to miners um, and many of them are insufficient equipment for gold mining. You should be getting a J, J and B, you know, uh, earth moving equipment. Yeah. Uh, and some of those are, are so useless as picks and shovels that they actually count against you and take you down many dead ends. Yeah. So I'm a big debunker of generally mathematically derived formulas. Bollinger bands that I've mentioned, there is a moving average in there in the middle and you have standard deviations in it. So there's a slight bit of mass, but and I've mentioned it positively already. Yeah. But the real value of the Bollinger Band is the pinch um, to me. That's the gift John Bollinger gave us, not um, bouncing off the innards and the outer parts, which you often solve in textbooks. So, uh, yeah, we, we focus a lot on volume and volume across not just histograms along the bottom, volume by price across through the price ranges, key levels of significance and natural geometry where support and resistance occurs within patterns and volatility squeezes. So we've, we're pattern-based, uh, and we do big time frame charts. The people that say, oh, well, technical analysis is really only, I've listened to all these, ex these excuses, and it's, it's built a career for me, a very profitable one, um, despite setbacks, uh, and a business on top of it. Uh, and they're all largely incorrect. They said technical analysis just for timing. I've heard it all, you know. Uh, and I'm saying, well, then you're looking at too small a time frame chart. You know, look at big, look at monthly charts to see what's going to happen in the big time frame. Uh, and you know, I, I've stood on a stage and I stated it six months even before standing on that stage in the example. And the only reason I mention the oil and gold is uh, to you is not social braggarts. As I keep stressing, we'll get things wrong too. But the probabilities were far higher than people were pricing in. Um, and we observe that because of watching big time frame charts and doing also what I call 360 degree analysis. I didn't just look at oil against the dollar. I said, there's something going on here. That's not enough. I looked at cross reference valuations on something I was very bullish that I felt was in a breakout structure, and that was gold. And I looked at gold versus oil. I looked at all of this. So we might, once we were on a theme, we mine horizontally, almost like those nasty frackers. Uh, you get something that's interesting. You go horizontal on it. You're drilling down, and then you go do relative valuation checks. So uh, I'm known for doing a lot of relative valuation charts across other things to find where is the weakest, where is the strongest. Once you want to, you're sniffing a bit of a bloodhound. You've got to become the bloodhound, yeah. the bloodhound that never gives up the trail and will pursue each end and doesn't fall for the, the phony, non-supportive aspects of lagging mathematical formulas as being any form of predictive tool. Yeah. So which tools should we avoid as traders, in your opinion? Just a, a brief list, <laughs> like the MACD or other indicators? This takes you on a deep dive. There's a short answer to this, and there's a detailed answer to this. I will infuriate and upset a lot of people by telling, them, telling you by most of them, and I'm including RSI, the most famous. I was in the STA. I passed the STA exam. You ask any traditional technical analyst, and I think this is an entire brain, uh, mind programming, uh, brain fart on behalf of them. They'll say, oh, the RSI, you know, the relative strength index and all of these things. Oh, divergence, divergence, you know, um, and it, it gives you confirmation. No, it doesn't give you confirmation. It's the same data in the upper half of your screen being re-represented to you with a bit of mathematical distortion and smoothing 
so that it's more palatable for you to consume. You can have seven other indicators. You haven't got eight reasons to do what you were thinking of doing. All you've got is the same reason remanifested in eight different ways to you. Um, and people get this. They sometimes need, when they're doing something of risk, they need that push in the back. It's kind of like your first uh, you know, uh, parachuting uh, attempt. You've done all the drills. You've got to believe in the kit. And the instructor just says, go on, mate, go on, and gives you that nudge. Just do it. Uh, just you know what to do. Just pull it. I'm following you. You'll be fine. Yeah. Um, psychologically, when putting on trades, people that have lost or been hurt or burnt, there's what's called um, a psychological elements. It's called snake bite uh, syndrome. Your fear of loss needs overcoming. So you need to find a crutch, a mental crutch that gives you the permission to do what you've already decided to do. So this is conception in terms of mindset. This is a very interesting topic. Humans are not rational. They are rationalizing. So what happens is you look at my face, you decide you don't like me, you observe me and find a reason why. Yeah. We're at a barbecue or something. Yeah. Uh, look at him. He didn't serve his wife first. Uh, what an asshole. Or, <laughs> yeah. You know, he knocked someone's drink over. What, you know, yeah, yeah. I knew he was a threat. Uh, you know, whatever the case may be. Or you look at someone and you like them and you say, oh, what a nice smile. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, he's in the middle of the conversation socially. In it. So what you actually do is you often make flash instinctive judgments which is driven by the amygdala part of the brain, which is your fight and flight mechanism, threat or non-threat. So, you know, if I'm big South African, bald-headed, piercing blue eyes, I might be intimidating. You would be wary just because we still think in caveman terms. Yeah. We have the, uh, the, the saber-toothed tiger. I'm not going to lash out and punch anybody for no reason, but we have these things. We are identifying threats and, non, and um, what I call amiables, non-threats that are clearly submissive or passive, et yeah. cetera. Yeah. And depending who you are, there's different things uh, that would be threats for a, a woman walking down a street versus uh, a man that's different. Um, and in the same way in markets, you know, we have fight and flight response, and it's the quickest natural response we have. So... My, my, my comment to all your viewers, and I should say listeners rather than viewers, <laughs> yeah. my, my first comment to them is your first response is wrong. Okay. Stop and think. Yeah. And go and do your research. Because what you'll actually look is you'll look and you'll look for a sign from the gods. And as you do that, the GBP USD will tick up twice because you're watching it on the five minute time frame. And you go, that's it. I thought it was a long, it's just given me the wink, um, yeah. the nod and the wink. I'm going to go in there. Uh, and so much of trading is that. And then you will say, and the moving average broke back then, and the RSI says so too, and this and this and this. So these become crutches, psychological crutches to do something you've already decided to do. That is the rationalizing. Uh, first you decide, then you find reasons that support your hypothesis. Yeah. The far better thing is the scientific approach. That is, everything remains to be proven and can and should be considered wrong until proven accurate. So in actual fact, you don't look for a quick decision or a quick bias on the day, on the morning or anything. Um, you have a very serious process that you follow. It's rigorous and you go through it. You're only trading one particular way, so you become a specialist. I always say, who makes the more money, the paramedic or the brain surgeon? Yeah, yeah. And that's the difference between being a generalist and um, a specialist. Yeah. Do one thing exceptionally well. You can actually be quite ignorant to the world of the move. I mean, I was in Tesla calls. Um, I was quite ignorant to that they were even being considered for the SP500 fundamental news. Yeah, yeah. It set up my pattern. It gave me my squeeze. And then, boom, we got a major gap. On Tesla. I think it's an overvalued company. I think it's a bunch of nonsense, but I also think it's a protected company. The other circle I didn't mention is my reset sniper. It's quite conspiratorial. There's a reason why Tesla has been so well supported. There's a reason why Stanley Druckenmiller, a smarter man than me, got killed with his shorts on Tesla and just gave up and walked away. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a marked company. It's like shorting Netflix, Amazon. It's unicorns, predetermined unicorns, some of them, you know, that might have bottomless overdrafts and will outlast you and will end up 
finding great value but through scale. Um, kind of like Amazon, the people who short Amazon. We, we, we will all agree, though, that Amazon executes very well. Uh, it's not like a conspiracy that it executes very well. But they were able to run at losses for nearly a decade uh, before they started turning profits. And they just scaled, 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 scaled. And they dominate. Um, and they've been allowed to dominate. They've not been pulled on monopoly. So sometimes uh, the reset sniper saves me from the shorting, the, the recognizing that COVID, maybe more people had an idea COVID was going to happen because the charts were already starting to show me. Um, Can you unpack that term a little bit for us, uh, the reset sniper? So the reset sniper looks at the unsustainability of the system and it looks into the history of the people that have been controlling the system um, across trans generations. Um, and it's, it's not, if I just talk about the oil trade, it's not ironic that the, all the heirs to David Rockefeller's, uh, the grandson of the original oil baron, uh, Standard Oil, have all exited oil and were actually suing Exxon and have all wrapped themselves in the green flag um, of that. So I felt additionally comforted with my uh, worldview of aggression to short and tendency to short that uh, there was going to be key clampdowns on that industry. And I actually feel fundamentally, that's not a technical opinion, obviously, but I feel fundamentally that we've passed not uh, peak supply oil, but we've probably passed peak demand oil. And that is going to be tough for us to move around to the same degree uh, unless you're prepared to take Bill Gates' experimental uh, vaccine and all the bio, biopharma crowd that uh, are helping him conduct, concoct those various uh, potions. The less said there, the better, because you know I'm not a doctor, but um, I'm very, very concerned about the development in the direction of the world on that front personally yeah yeah so while you were thinking to shore oil are you were you at the same time exploring opportunities with renewable energy so i think green has to be made to win because the system wants it that way aka the world economic forum and all of that i'm not sure yet that they've actually done sufficient to be absolutely 100% uh, super high profit uh, area. So I think it's kind of like the carbon offsets things. They can limp along for a long time before they stand up on their own two feet. So I was looking more at the financial failure of the system and the fact that ongoing proliferation is going to occur. And we, were, we had what we call a macro hunt volatility funnel set up on gold, not ironically on the dollar, but against both the euro and the pound, which is typical of us finding structure. So the dollar had a bit of its own interesting signature over the last few years, but we had the perfect structures on gold pound and gold euro. So when I was looking at shorting the oil, I wasn't looking, I'm not binary and feeling I have to go polar opposite. The actual interesting part was actually uh, gold. At some point, I'm sure we'll have some green heroes that will hit really high money. And, you know, I'm a fan of solar. I'm not so sure the others have all proven yet their viability uh, yet. But solar requires a lot of silver. We saw the gold setup. So we said we looked at the gold oil charts. We saw further confirmation, again, utilizing our specific way of approaching charts and looking at it in terms of what we think is important uh, and eliminating all things that aren't. Because when you have clutter in there, it saves you, it, it, it takes away brain space for the really important stuff. So I'm like an Ikea guy. I want minimalist. Unless it's adding value, I eliminate. Otherwise, it's noise and distraction. Um, and so that sort of Swedish design of clean surfaces is, works for me, both in properties and in other things. Everything functional and large and roomy and spacious and clean lines. So our charts are very busy, but everything that's on there Will be re will be required uh, and worthwhile and contributing. So going back to your cue, uh, the gold was set up in exactly our setup for uh, euro and pound. So we traded euro and pound, but we also traded dollar and we closed the dollar because we didn't see that uh, it not working on the dollar as well. We just knew where our targets were on uh, gold. So our setup is very specific. You get an entry, a clear stop, and you get a uh, target. 
generated yeah. from that. So in other words, you know in advance if you're triggered into your trade. We don't use market orders. It mar the market must self-confirm by running you in, which is another very key um, performance point. And you immediately know what RRR you're in, and therefore your sizing is calculatable before. Too many technical pro processes do not provide those three core elements, entry, stop, and target. And I, I realized very early on, if you don't have that, how do you size correctly? Do you work to a, a ratio of something like three to one? Our aggregate is higher than that. We've landed 62.1. Um, oh, wow. And uh, we've had a number of 100 to ones in, uh, in running. I mean, even our current Bitcoin long position that we're holding, um, it's super tight uh, on the stop. Um, we just had a small little wind up on that. Our own students have just landed. I've just, had, I mean, I can literally screenshot it in our communities. Landed his first nineteen to one as student. That's and as I say, most traders. When I, and I taught trading in an yeah. academy where it, which wasn't run by me, where I was actively lecturing and delivering content uh, early on in my career. And I looked over people's shoulders, and they think they're getting one is to one or one is to two. And then you said, just show me your closed trades. And I'm afraid just about everyone to a T is getting significantly less than one is to one and are often snatching profits and letting losses run. So they yeah. inverse uh, they inverse RRR, <laughs> if that makes sense. Okay, right, yeah. Yeah, oh gosh. Yeah, so when were you teaching? Um, so I still teach today, but I teach my own program in my own community with pre-recorded content. And then I, I analyze the market live and release what I call jump shares, uh, on all the aspects and people engage and they learn in that environment as well as follow what I'm doing. Um, but I was teaching in a, somebody else's business in an academy in London. Um, it was actually the London trading academy, it was called, and, uh, they had a more traditional technical analysis approach. Okay. and. Uh, I kept feeling responsible that certain parts of the curriculum, I would say, I need to teach you this. Please don't use it. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. So I, I was an active trader myself. And, uh, you know, you've got to, there's a difference between passing an exam and being a guy who's well prepared to make money in the markets. Yeah. Yeah. So your own school or college or online college, if you like, uh, you're taking people through live sessions on a regular basis? Like yes. Every day? That kind of yeah. thing? Yes. So w w the combination of what we do is first you swat up on theory that we pre-recorded to get an understanding of jargon, what we're looking for, the basics and everything yeah. so that everybody participates in the communities to a high standard. doesn't help you have people that just completely, it's annoying to people that are good at what they do to have, uh, I mean, generally people are kind and will help along, but at the same time, people should get to a minimum standard level. So they, they watch and work their way through that. And then simultaneously, they participate live in the markets. And I'm giving updates daily from, you know, screen shares, talking like I am to you, only you'll see the chart and I will illustrate and I draw. So I've got a Wacom screen with, you know, drawing on. So it's very, very clear where I'm pointing, why I'm pointing there. Uh, it's annotated, it's live, and it's done on a live market and it's released in the premium community. I'll sometimes leave quick voice messages and other various forms of interaction. And people have what's like a WhatsApp structure under each of the core markets, crypto, traditional markets, commodities, FX, um, indices and equities. And then everybody's encouraged to do setups, which is actually implement that which they've learned, um, because actually doing is the learning. Um, and yeah. there'll be a few people who nod their head that's ever done anything. You could theoretically show me how to become a black belt. But me standing here and watching yeah, it, you? YouTube yeah. <laughs> is not going to make that happen. So uh, that's re really the real learning. And so the, it's a bespoke platform. We don't just jump on Discord or one of these many white label things. We've built, I've invested quite a lot in this, and we've built a bespoke platform where people do setups with four views of charts, volume by price done in a certain way. And each one you do the template. And this, for this forces you into a process where you start to distill insights. And you then suddenly break on through to the other side where you initially came to make money and you start to learn to love your charting because you start to become a, a soothsayer. Not always right, but often on, on things that most people would consider as unlikely. And yeah. that's, that's super empowering. And the people start to really love their chart. Then you see them annotate. You see that care 
and it's actually relaxing and they're doing it with joy and they're doing it very well. That ups my game. I've got to say, man, that's beautiful. I've got to keep myself to that standard. So it's, it, it's almost like your accountability group as well. And it's your non hypocrisy group. You can't say and teach one thing and act out another. And, yeah. you know, the emotional tendencies in markets are powerful. I mean, we long Bitcoin. My main job has just been keeping the guys net long Bitcoin from the 10K. We're in a macro, huge time frame yeah. chart. Yeah. And everybody, well, the minute they're making money, they start thinking of some small, obscure coin that could quadruple. Uh, and shouldn't I move into this now, now that I've made some profit on Bitcoin? And it's like Bitcoin dominance. It's winning. All the other charts against Bitcoin are looking softer and are pulling back. This is new money coming in. It's following the main brand. That's a fundamental argument. We have a macro HVF setup on a big time frame from 10,000. We're going to, we, on balance of probabilities, we're performing exceedingly well. All compliance is the more you get what you expect, the more you adhere to process. We're going to get our $26,000 targets. We might have a little bit of choppiness after there, and then we're probably going to overperform quite substantially. And then this ties into the reset sniper, which is the financial system is broken. And there's going to be proliferation of money. There's going to be an on-ramp for UBI. In fact, I would argue that these, I've been saying UBI will come. There's no doubt politically they want to bring these things about. I've been saying that for three years when the first time I heard about UBI, I was walking in Greenwich Park in 2017 saying, you know, this thing just won't go away. They want to bring this. Uh, so the pandemic has led to this uh, furlough schemes. This is extending the furlough scheme in the UK. And you're getting similar things in the States. This is very much a Western phenomenon. This is all designed to get people comfortable with being dependent on state and receiving money. So the, uh, that is dependency. Well, guess what? If they then attach a condition that you better take their vaccine, if you wish to continue to get your furlough, you're going to be forced because you haven't built your own income in the meantime on an online business and you've become reliant on state because you were a restauranteur and your shop, your restaurant can't open anymore. Then, uh, then you know you're going to do like you're bloody well told because you're dependent. Uh, and I don't think that's a, ever a good place to be. You know, the whole goal for I'm, I'm a freedom seeker and I also seek self dependency and self reliance. Um, to all the people of your listeners here, do not become reliant on state for your income because when they start establishing conditions for the ongoing delivery of that and you've become cozy and you're sitting and watching Netflix for four hours and getting up at 10.30 in the morning, um, don't let your life descend into that. It's not gonna, there's no happiness at the end of that tunnel and yeah, you'll yeah. be owned. Um, so, you know. Francis, you mentioned UBI. Can, can you tell us what that stands for? Universal Basic Income. Yeah, so okay. There is a big push through the World Economic Forum, the IMF, and various other transnational agencies that seem to be funded by a certain collection of people that are pushing for a whole new economic system, which smells very much like communism to me, but never will be described as such. Bolshevik form of communism, um, where you know robots and things and AI are getting to a point where labor, remember, I mean, I'll, if, Capitalism is built on labor, the availability of capital and an entrepreneur, and then a service requirement that is being a service or a product that is being manufactured. If we now deem there's too many people on the planet and there's now robots that do things more efficiently and we are within striking distance of them doing most things more efficiently and they can be programmed to do so, to many people, dangerous people, high up in the echelons, they now have a surplus of labor that damage the planet in their worldview, create too much plastic, and uh, that's a worrying thing for me. You know, there are there is a there's a group of people that are eugenicists. So I'm concerned about what these people might be thinking, uh, and I'm concerned about where that vaccine and the pandemic and getting everybody on the dole, equivalent of the dole, only called universal basic income, where you get paid just for being born. Thank you. It sounds very, very nice, but I'm quite capable of generating my own means and you're proliferating the fiat and thereby devaluing it for those that have saved and earned that same fiat that you're now proliferating to give to free to somebody who wants to lie in bed and watch Netflix all day. So I've got to get out of the money that you intend to proliferate. And this is also why gold and silver, I'm still a macro bull, even 
pattern-based targets have been met, we get overperformance and we get new targets. So trends keep continuing until an equal and opposite force works upon Gold has been very uncertain since that big sell-off, what was in the summer, wasn't it? I can't remember the month, but what do you make of that? That it, it's, you know, it's, I don't remember what the last price of against the dollar spot gold was around 1900, wasn't it? So it's done exactly what it should do. And the reason why uh, it's going to congest for a while. So we have what's called five stages of a breakout post target. Once you've made the target, there's a period that's called progress decay, which means time elapses and you have pullbacks and no m more fresh upside. Now, the gold pound and the gold euro patterns that had excellent geometry and structure that generated the, the targets, and we got out right at the top on the pounds. We're talking 1,740 pounds is on the gold euro, and on the gold pound, we got out at 1,560. Uh, it's very close to the tops on both of them. And you actually had the high point for those patterns were in 2011. And the breakout occurred in 2019. So in essence, you've had an eight-year structural hunt volatility funnel pattern, which is essentially a constriction in volatility and a tightening after a bull move, a massive bear market, then an echo bull that didn't go as high, and then a softer bear, and then a third final little ripple, which is far smaller. That has unfolded over eight years in scale. That has taken you from the 950 when we bought to the, the, the 1560, which is the better part of about 60% in move. So the progress decay cycle for such a massive pattern will be longer than people think. But you are still in a bull and you are just shaking your head. You're bloated. You're feasted. You're bloated. You're still an athlete. You're still Usain Bolt. But you won the gold medal uh, at 1560. You went on a drinking binge uh, and living it up and ate pizza and everything. And you've got your hangover and you're a bit, con you know, you're a bit constipated. I love the analogy. Yeah, yeah. So you will get your running shoes on again to all those, assuming you have from your interest in gold. And I, I mean, I'm long GDXJ um, on equities, on long-term calls and um, first majestic uh, silver. Uh, and I can say to you also, on that whole gold bull market call, by the way, we, 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 we were very fortunate. So I'm talking a lot about good calls we made, not because I'm trying to sell flatter, please. But the gold-silver ratio was one we really, really nailed. Uh, yeah. And the YouTube's up there. Go follow the channel, The Market Sniper. You can go see it. And you can see the wrong ones too. And there's some or plenty of those too. So, you know, it's not about being wrong and right. It's about making money and recognizing it. But this is informative for your interest in gold. We had an outlier run up to 128. It was a blow off of a rising wedge on the gold silver ratio. And we were watching that like hawks because we expected it to spill. And we were, sh we were aggressively long silver at 112 when we got our first. Um, this was after running 128. So I'm talking about the gold silver ratio. That means at one point you needed 128 ounces of silver to buy one single ounce of gold. So silver hadn't moved. In fact, the COVID, the lows for silver were the COVID lows. It actually went even lower yeah. than it had done any previous point, but gold didn't. So this was COVID was your massive look one day. They often shake out. There's a final shakeout. This is technical analysis gold for the guys listening. This is so important. In the same way COVID was the same for Bitcoin, the, the March lockdown uh, dramas. It was the final shakeout of patient gold uh, and silver holders before a major move. And it boy yep. was it. And the gold-silver ratio spiked to 128. So I've got uh, – that's on Oanda. I actually also took the gold futures and divided it by the silver futures. It's such an important chart. As people that see the loss, the devaluation of money, gold and silver is very interesting to me too. Um, you know, it's the Bitcoin before Bitcoin showed up, only it's physical, it, you know, power down, it's still there. Uh, when networks go down and internet goes down, you can still hold it. So it has its advantages, it has its disadvantages. So that turning point when we were at 113 rallying, we got a first inverted HVF setup. We said, this is it. Metals bull is about to start. At 113 after the top run. You were still buying silver very, very cheap, and it just it just suddenly played to a degree catch up 
and it's not even got to the, uh, the previous high of 1921. Silver actually traded just shy of $50, $49. So it's still lagging overall where gold is now. So silver is going to uh, come and gold is going to come again and silver will play catch up and silver miners will play catch up. Have you got some idea when the, the bull run is going to start up again? Well, we watch both the gold silver ratio for uh, bearish patterns because you want that to go down. So for those not familiar, the gold silver ratio is something you want to go down because silver should be going up quicker than gold. Um, there's a bit of a descending triangle setting up right now on the daily stroke four hourly time frame. If you've got any technicians who like to look at charts there, um, and that's all leaning on, wait for it, the law of round numbers 75. So 75, 76 ounces. Don't forget, we're down from 128 ounces uh, on the gold uh, silver ratio. So we have already started the run. My personal view is I think we could get, and wait for it, this is going to be a real nutters call, single digit uh, gold uh, silver ratio. We could run the 10. I think we'll just get a step through the 10 at its higher point. That could see silver three digits, even four digits uh, at some point in the future. That's a lot that has to happen uh, for that to happen. Yeah. Do you trade ETFs in gold and silver or, or just spot gold or? How do you usually trade it? I trade the underlying commodity and I buy physically the underlying commodity. I don't buy ETFs. Um, but if I've got a short term trade with a setup on a moderate time frame, not part of the macro, and I just want to take a quick hit and I'm using leverage, I could trade an ETF. But I never consider owning an ETF as the same light as holding the physical gold and silver. So I encourage people to hold shares in gold and silver miners and to hold actual metal um, under their control, not even in a, um, what I'd call, what is it, uh, the vaults with either banks, governments, or even private uh, lockers, you know. Yeah, name for yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Mm. Reaching for my words a bit this morning. Uh, but so, you know, don't be, rather take the risk of burglary and keep your mouth shut and put it under your floorboards of your kitchen or under the pool or in the back garden somewhere, um, then leave it. Because I do actually think the reset that is coming is going to be very authoritarian. Hence why I mentioned Bolshevik communism. This isn't good news for your guys, but I'm, I'm assuming they're okay with a bearish take. The key, key thing is this is a polarizing event for wealth building. Most people will be flattened out and leveled out. If you play the cards right, you could be uh, significantly better off. So that's the only way to view it optimistically. Yeah, do you think the markets are going to dip again significantly in the next three to four months? It's very difficult to say, of course. With I, I think it's unlikely that they'll continue to go out without some shaking out, but the long run, and the only thing that concerns is leverage. If you're an investment, it's less of a problem. It's not that I'm a bull and I think valuations are fair. I think they're overly done horrifically in the markets. But I think you've got to compare it to the equally toxic, toxic alternatives and the fact that they're going to proliferate money. So money has to find a home. And billionaire class don't need to buy nappies and food, any more food. They have all the sushi they can eat. Um, they, they just uh, will invest. So do you buy a bond that's yielding nothing and is guaranteed to lose value? Do you leave cash in a bank that's going to get proliferated and is guaranteed to lose value? Or do you hold your nose and buy a hyper overvaluated Amazon that's probably going to be, you know, 50% of all online retail in America if it isn't already there? Going back to technical analysis and timeframes, macro, et cetera, when you say you look at the very historical timeframes, you, I, I guess that's you're starting with perhaps a month? Months, super macro, we call it. So we have like a three plus one timeframe views for every setup that we, we analyze. Um, and we like it best when you have four green lights. You know, the super macro is green, um, which means the long-term trend is up. Yeah, um, the trend view, which is not the monthly chart, it's more, uh, more that that precedes your pattern, the bulk of that. Because we look at what, if it's a continuation pattern, what is being continued? Is there a clear trend prior to your continuation pattern? That's what we call a trend view. Then we look at the pattern itself. 
Um, so if it's a daily pattern, the super macro would be monthly, the trend view would be weekly, the daily is the pattern, we analyze the daily pattern, are we sure it's up, not down, um, it, because squeezes, when we're wrong, we're usually 180 degrees wrong. It doesn't cost you any more or less being completely wrong. Um, and that often, again, is a, a ridicule point for us, but we are okay with that. We know we don't do mildly wrong, usually because when you get a tightening and a real constriction and you get a sudden move, um, it's only two outcomes. It's a sudden move to the upside or it's a sudden yeah. move to the downside. And if you've assessed it to be bullish and it's bearish, um, you're 100% wrong. But the point is, if you've got stops in, you don't pay any more for being 100% wrong, not just marginally wrong <laughs> so yeah it's a yeah. moot point about being wrong being wrong is wrong no matter how wrong you are and even early is wrong <laughs> so the right is being taken into the market and being then participating into a, a really strong single-minded move where the demand is over dominating the supply and you're in a rocket ship and you're going largely up Barring some small rests. Our method even have interim target levels where we anticipate a rest. So for those that are watching and following, this is live and current. Once we've run 19,000 in our view on Bitcoin, we expect there may be a small, uh, a reasonably significant reaction. Okay. We are in a super macro, so we remain very bullish there. By the way, we did analysis where we divide gold, uh, Bitcoin by gold and the NASDAQ by gold. So many instances, the, ma the big markets that are sucking in cash. So if we all agree that there's a proliferation of fiat currency going to come with all these UBI programs and salaries for nothing um, and, you know, this destruction of value and no real uh, interest rate policy because everything's zero or near zero, yeah. um, we're in a highly liquidity-enhancing state. There's couple of things you can do with your money. It's not an endless list. Stock market, bonds, which I won't touch because debt is, our is the true bubble. People will say gold is a bubble if it goes up to three grand. It's not a bubble. It's standing still. Everything else is devaluing relative to it. Um, debt is the real bubble. The money creation, debt, we are the, we're at the fag end of a uh, debt expansion scheme, which is why they all suddenly talking about reset. If you think it's coincidence, fine. I don't like coincidences. But you have Klaus from the World Economic Forum and all these other people talking about um, time for a new reset, a fairer, greener system. It's because we're at the end of a system and these pigs have finished troughing out on it and they know the game's up and they need to reset the clock and then they'll, they'll start a new cycle. Um, so with that understanding, if you concur with that thought process, you can put your money in stocks. You don't want to put it in debt. There could be debt to release. And those, that debt is some pension funds asset, don't forget. So yeah. you, this UBI could also replace pension funds, which will all be zeroized when they write off debt of corporates and governments. So they'll say, yeah, oh, okay, you lose your pension, but we've got this new scheme called UBI. You'll get paid something. It's just being paid from a different source and being given a different name. Um, mm. And that's how it's pretty scary that because yeah, yeah. accounting is, you know, it's a T, T account. It's liability and asset. You kill all, you kill all these liabilities that, are, that see us no longer be able to maintain a normal economic system because we've, we've just created so much debt and it's end of times for the cycle. Well, guess what? Um, we write it all off while well, you kill everyone's assets. So that means pensions. If you're in the UK, you have self-invested personal pensions. You should be stuffed with gold, silver, and Bitcoin if you can find it. And if you can't buy Bitcoin direct, there is a grayscale Bitcoin ETF. Um, you can at least get some of the upside on it. Uh, and that's what I would be doing. And the people say, oh, but uh, by the way, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just talking about what I, how I position when I say oh, it. Yeah. But people say, well, you should follow traditional financial advice. Every good portfolio has bonds and equities in it. That is for the mid cycle. That is from the beginning of the cycle to when you start to get to the stages we're in. Um, at exceptional times, you don't do everyday advice. You need exceptional preparation. Bonds yeah. and debt are bad investments. They're guaranteed losers and they could be written off to zero and they pay nothing. Why do you have them? So that means smart people buy shares, gold, silver, and uh, crypto. Yeah. When did you first get into crypto? 
70. I had a lot of people nagging me that keep saying that we were getting lots of very clean HPF setups during 2016. And I was like, shut up with your gamer coin to buy a better gun to shoot Joe Schmo that you spend the whole day on, you know, peeing in a bottle playing games with. What's this nonsense? This isn't real markets. Uh, you know, I had that kind of ha 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 uh, yeah. attitude. And then I thought about it a bit more. I started getting uh, sucked in. And then I had an ex-student, actually, from the London Trading Academy, also from the UK, uh, that I taught and loved HVF Method and stayed in touch with me, who got quite heavily involved. And he said, no, you've got to come. And he actually uh, paid me. He started up a company and he was asset managing in the space. And he paid for me to pop over what his company did to the, the 2017 consensus show in New York. And I started to get to see what's going on. A lot more like-minded people, a lot more people that realize it's end of game. You know, very much the Ron Paul libertarian, um, sound money, and that, you know, pretty much this game is the time's up for the traditional financial system. And now they're talking openly about it, the, these controlling forces. Yeah, well, now even the banks are getting in, in on it, aren't they? Uh, yes, the central banks want a digitalized token and the individual banks are quite concerned, I think, about their future. I think there might be a sacrificial uh, lizard's tail, as I've said in some of my YouTube content, because apart from capital markets, I'm not sure retail banking, um, once you have crypto and crypto accounts, you need branches and networks anymore. There will be a, you know, a handover period. There will be many old people that are very traditional that still have their savings books toddle over to the branch. But yeah, yeah. Um, they, they will just wind down the support for that and leave the people to work out and get their kids to teach them, you know, how they have to do everything online. They want to digitize. They want to kill cash. They've wanted to kill cash for a long time. I think as we go into a reset period, I think there's going to be another calamity coming, I'm afraid to say. The whole point of how you close out a period is you have to bring on chaos, which are the problems, so that you get the reaction you want so that you can get people to accept the solution you plan which is part of the Hegelian dialectic of problem, reaction, solution. Uh, and I think hacking and various other things, um, this vaccine and the multiple rollout, people that think you'll only get one vaccine, I think you're mistaken. There'll be updates like viruses in your computer, you know, updates and all of this. And once you start taking that, you will be giving them a highway into your bloodstream with whatever they choose to put in. And there'll be updates. There's already talk of CV21. Um, and then, oh, this one's more deadly and blah, 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 blah. Who knows what's going on there? I won't go too far reset or conspiratorial for you, but uh, the key the, the aspect around that is that there's going to be more crisis. So you need to have a combination of cash on you now because if you have to survive through uh, a grid down attack, grid as in electricity, where both mobile network and internet network could be affected, and they will blame it on the Russians, the Chinese. It's an attack on our democracy. You know, they love to talk, puff their chests out and say, hey, what's good for our democracy? And democracy, their democracy is not a democracy. But anyway, politically speaking, uh, we've got to watch out. Uh, and so you should have cash at home. You should have gold and silver coins at home. And you should have crypto, even if, you don't, even if you're not sure about crypto. Because you can send money when banking systems are down wallet to wallet and that might mean you need to do a, a bit of polishing up and being able to do that you need that ammo in your uh in your store to see you through potential uh turmoil with the banking sector the banks are largely bust most of them i know people say that all the time and and they keep limping on but they've been maintained they've been maintained uh, kept up going back to your course what do New students, well, how are they started off? Are, are they um, are they going through a whole series of videos and um, s stuff like that, or or do they just jump into the live rooms and learn as as you're teaching that way? Uh, so we we open all up. We don't lock them up just to videos. Um, if you come into the full blown community, um, it's 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 expensive. Um, and it's for a full year to, so that you at least get a, an experience of different markets and you can stay on afterwards um, separately to, the, uh, to your initial um, investment. But uh, you'll get a combination of learning the theory uh, from beginner, intermediate, and advanced. 
So it will be in three levels of structure. You'll be in a community, a free community platform, which is, as I say, WhatsApp friendly, but also has the setups area where you can see what other people are finding and posting. I prefer not to uh, push it as a trade ideas, but un- invariably you will see lots of things being presented um, as trades practically in the market as it's happening. Yeah. Um, we analyze them. Every, every setup that is done isn't necessarily a tape. We say this is good for that reason, this is not so good for that reason. So you'll get feedback uh, on the quality all in a WhatsApp type structure underneath it. So it's easy chat. You can go at John and it'll tag the person you're discussing with. Multiple people will uh, engage. Uh, some will share their version. We have Trading View, the chart platform. So it will embed the charts so you can actually see what's going on. Um, it's very it's very visual friendly. We're charters. You know, it's about uh, being able to see, draw, annotate, and share. And other people must be able to see exactly what you're saying and what you're thinking. Uh, and then comment below that uh, and respond. So I, I have a kind of a trade leaders, which is a sort of a top-down board where everything I'm thinking and saying gets done and everybody gets to see that and they automatically subscribe to that. And then I drop down into the individual boards and I can have a conversation just with two or three people and only those that are in that room are interested will be uh, responding. Um, and we continue. We, we do non-farm uh, payroll, for example, every time. We, get, we have an hour and a half on the traditional markets and an hour and a half on the crypto markets. Um, I'm doing jump shares, which are pretty one-sided. And then I have uh, three or four trade uh, leaders, insiders. These are students that have reached a very high standard and that have been with me for a long time. And you will see they will do live webinars. They go open. We have a go-to meeting. So they, they go open mic. You can ask questions um, of the trade leader and he'll respond. He'll do a short presentation period. Then he'll give some feedback on some set- setups. And then you will ask questions and engage uh, and say, hey, I'm looking at this. I thought this share was looking great. What do you think? And then you'll bring it up. You'll say that's good for that reason and that's bad. So it's live and it's in a live market environment because the learning is doing in a practical environment. But as I say, we, we need people to work their way through the videos. They get rank as you pass your videos. Um, so there's a little bit of gamification in that. Uh, so you're encouraged to learn. And if you post good setups, um, you get rank and acknowledgement like uh, medals. So people can see you've been around for a while and you've posted a number of good setups. So over time, you, you gain some seniority. Um, and as I say, most people at the end of their year can't, can't afford to leave because they've just been, had too many, uh, they've learned too much and they've had too many. And trading isn't just positive experiences. I hasten to, you know, people fantasize. So if there's someone who's just about starting, no matter what method you have, if you don't employ good money management and you don't stick to the rules around money management and we have money management sheets we provide or how you apply it specifically to HBF method, where the stops are, all of these things. If you don't ever do them and you just wing it in and you blow up your account, you can have, a, you can have yourself a terrible time. Um, so uh, you, can, you, know, you can't buy success in trading the market. Otherwise, everyone would just write the check because yeah, once, you, yeah. once you're successful in the trading market, you can almost write any check you want. Um, but you can buy and in really uh, smart because of the price point. It's not cheap, as I've mentioned. We get a very high quality of guy, largely male. We have a couple of awesome females, um, um, but they usually STEM. They were computer programmers, engineers, architects, or property entrepreneurs. So the risk profile: property entrepreneurs run their own business. Um, if they're on the professional side, they'll be in tech, engineering, mathematics, but also with a bit of art, architects as well. That's typical. That doesn't mean it's universal. You know, we have a plumber and we have a butcher and a baker and a candlestick maker as well. So there's no, there's no 100% uh, rules for that, but that's typical um, uh, profile. They, the, the people appreciate the geometry, the artistry, the symmetry of our method and what it implies and the additional information it provides. And these are people that appreciate the value of process. So typically through my YouTube channels, which I put out preview, is something that's resonated with them. And they've already self-actualized to a reasonably high degree in some form or another. That's why we, they, they readily own their own outcomes and various other things. There's a lot of crybaby, particularly in crypto, a lot of newbie kids that a lot of maturity that still got to come their way um, right. and sense of entitlement or, or getting ahead of themselves, you know, mastering the markets, dominating the market. 
you don't. It's the ocean. Right? You're a surfer in the ocean. It can kill you any time. If you don't respect the sea, you get drowned. So it's that kind of view. And most of those people are already um, successful and pretty mature. And they, they love it. Um, and we've got a great set of community. We, we get into other things um, in our community. The reset side of things sees us talk about, you know, how much of your income you retain, what you can do to protect some of that. You know, for example, if you're in the UK, you can actually have a Panama Corporation. You know, your Tories, Prime Minister and everybody else has had, and you're not even running for politics in office. You can have a corporation and you can trade uh, through a corporation. We have companies that offer high leverage in Europe because we know the leverage has been cut down. When you're right, you do want to be damn right, but you've got to know the difference between being right uh, and having certainty because certainty is almost imminent failure but having a very high probability likelihood of being accurate. Um, and then it's handy to be able to have access to 100 is to 1 leverage. So we've sourced those kind of brokers uh, that you can use. You do that through a Panama company. You make a substantial amount of money. Uh, the corporation is not subject to uh, tax. You can pay out dividends. There's various ways. So um, I don't believe in overfunding an irresponsible government that is destroying your currency and is likely to inflict hardship on the masses, is currently destroying the small and medium enterprise industry right now at a macroeconomic. So I'm an economist. I'm a fundamental person too. Just because I trade global macro technical doesn't mean I'm unaware of all of these forces. So, you know, irresponsible money, they don't deserve to take your money to be irresponsible. What brokers would you recommend to new traders? So the new traders, I prefer to keep them away from leverage. Leverage truly is death. If you want to start up a brokerage, and there's a lot of shady brokerages in Cyprus, binary yeah. options from Israel set up here and these kind of places, the first thing they do is give obscene leverage. Yeah. And then they just hold the other end of your trade. Now, in the UK, you can't benefit out of somebody else's, your client's ill doing. But there's actually been shown on FXCM, I think it was, that they were selling the flow of retail traders because it's very profitable. Retail traders generally lose. Yeah. So, you know, our whole premise is based on the 91% lose. It's not quite as high as that. Some will say in the upper 70s, it depends by vary. It will vary the stats on any given. Yeah. It's, how it's to high, become the 9%. That's our strap line. How do you how to become yeah. that nine percent? You can argue yeah. it's 20, the the twenty two percent. It doesn't matter. But the point being, they generally lose. And the more leverage you give them, the faster they lose. So they deposit money and then they they hand over ownership to that money to you in time with leverage. Um, so someone who's new, I would almost uh, prefer he almost had no leverage at all and traded investments and traded a hamburger and made a coke uh, or lost. A lost a you know a, a box of Rizzlers or whatever the case may be, super small, and yeah. went through form and function and recognized it's not about money. It's kind of like Karate Kid. You need polish on, polish off, nonstop. Keep sanding that house because you've got to learn the drills and the basics. And people just want to get to the bit where they make the money, and that yeah. impatience is what blows you up. It's kind of like never mind you know screw the icebergs, full steam uh, ahead. You know never mind the landmine field, and then you've got to go. You've got to go to go drone pick them up when they've blown their legs and their crotch off uh, because they're charged into the minefield. Um, you've got to, they've really got to be slowed down in the beginning. Retail traders need to be slowed down. All the things that attracted you there in the first place, fast money, status, Porsche turbos, you think in terms of I'll buy this, I'll buy that. I'm in this for lifestyle. I want to have a better lifestyle. All those things are prone to the quick sizzle bucks, the adrenal and the amygdala-based responses. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. Case of, so there true. is no easy money. Yes, you could have a fluke, um, but long term. the next time, <laughs> you'll, yeah, you'll screw it up. Taken back. You can have nine flukes in a row. Because if the 10th trade is without money management, you will give all that back and more. So the real print, the, the, the first thing that needs to be learned is that leverage fight. Uh, and you've got to earn the right to leverage. So the first thing is to trade them without leverage uh, and have them just doing simple basics. And then you slowly graduate um, towards uh, maybe one is to one. In the absence of method, emotions rule. Yeah. 
And yeah. uh, we have method and we have preordained, de predetermined. Uh, this is where we'll be entered long or short. And that's where the stop is immediately becomes live. And that's the target and walk away and leave it. This is set and forget trading. You can go to the golf course on my style of trading. You can't go anywhere if you just thought it's going up and you bought. What do you do when it starts going down? Well, you react. What is, what is, what is that as a strategy? Emotional, psychological yeah. and emotional. You, and pain is the only thing that gets you out of the trade. If it goes up in your favor, you stay in because you expect more. Greed keeps you in. Pain takes you out. Always. Yeah. So what do you do? Your mindset of adrenal endorphin responses, which you're now, you're essentially a drug addict, will keep you excited as long as it's going your way and only absolute pain will take you out, which is an obliteration of your account. Yeah. And it turns into an arm wrestle with a market that you have no power over and you're just a real, the smallest of mice amongst elephants. Yeah. So um, Forex is also skittish and it never stops. I would prefer people learned on equities and actually cryptos give very clean patterns and there's also a bull bias right now. And yeah. Most people have an inherent bull bias as well. They find it easier to go long. You have truly developed as a trader when you know how to short. I mean, the money I've made on the short side, uh, I'm more proud of than the money I've made on the long side. Only way you can do short is very tight methodology, very clear evidence of when you turn short, very clear evidence when you go long. Um, we flip charts over all the time to eliminate bull bias. Is it still a buyer? Is it a sell? Does it go up or down? We teach all of this in the program and many other techniques because you actually come as a miscalibrated weapon. It's like you've got a sight and it's set off to the left and you put it on the target and you keep missing the target. And the problem is there's no teacher to show you where the bullet actually is flying past. So you don't know. You keep shooting to the left. What you actually need is you need a target. You need the target pulled to you. You need to see where it actually hits and where you're aiming. And then you have to start resetting your sight. You have an inherent bull bias as anybody who comes to the market because it's open-ended profits to the upside, optimism reflex. Um, but there's finite amount that you can gain to the downside. You have a bull bias. How do you eliminate bull bias? Well, we, we have techniques for doing that. And you need resetting your sights. That's why we're the sniper. In the, the sniper analogy comes, and this is a small side step for you, is in World War II, 250,000 rounds were fired by the average infantryman for every actual fatality. Most people don't realize these numbers. War is very beneficial for the people that fund it, and it's exceedingly wasteful. So if the game is throwing a piece of lead at somebody else, soldiers do it exceedingly badly. In other words, we fire things into the trees and into the air to keep heads down. The amount of uh, actual resultant fatalities as rounds, one in 250. Can I say, when we went to the jungle in Vietnam with automatic weapons, it went to 450. So a sniper is completely different, and his fatality to shot ratio is 1.3. 1.3 rounds for every fatality. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just asking you what kind of guy do you want to be in this market? Do you want to run around with a Uzi spraying in the air and think you're not going to get taken out in the open? Good luck trading here. The job isn't trading. People think trading is order entry. Jump in here, jump in there, jump out, try this, that didn't work, try that. Must be busy, must be busy, run around, shoot, shoot, shoot. You're making a broker rich and you're giving, handing over your deposit. That's what you're doing. You're yeah. a fool, high on acid, running around in the open, spraying your Uzi. You're going to get yeah. killed. Someone's going to snipe you. The sniper, most of it is observation. They're the reconnaissance of most armies. They're very high rank. They're very, very strong-willed, very, very endurant people, maybe out on their own or with a spotter. And when they shoot, they absolutely expect a fatality, only when they shoot. They will have been aiming and having that sight on his head for a while and will wait for the perfect movement into the open so that it goes straight through the right part. They're not even thinking about the head. They're thinking what part of their head they want to go through. That's why you end up with someone completely dead, more often than not. And I'm not a fan of war. The analogy is about effectiveness. Yeah. So what should happen is you should trade less. The reason why snipers have such a great hit-to-kill ratio is they don't fire very often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, contrary a lot to… Of, a lot of planning. Yeah. All yeah. of the work in trading is not in the order entry of the trade. Yeah, it's in the analysis. It's, it's, it's sitting and crapping in the same hole for five weeks, waiting for a clean shot 
on a high value target and ignoring soldiers walking past you within a hundred yards that you could take because you'd give your position away and you'll shoot one grunt. You're a, you're a captain, a lieutenant, a spotter with glasses. You're the most highly trained, most specifically best weapons, everything. You're far too valuable. And, you know, a queen on the chessboard doesn't run around sacrificing itself for a pawn. The general shows up to check a landing site with just his driver because he doesn't want anyone to know, and you've shot him both, and you've changed the course of a war. Yeah. That's a sniper. Well, on that note, we should uh, wrap it up, Francis. It's been great talking to you. And uh, you know, pe- people should uh, definitely check out, if they haven't already, your various uh, classes. Yeah, I'll give you a little breakdown of what people can do if they wanted to take it further. We have a free mini series, entirely free. You drop an email um, in, you will get a free mini series. You get a video a day. If you want to accelerate it and you're enjoying it, you can just say, send me the next. Um, just lays a foundation for people who are thinking of trading. Even for intermediates, it's worth going back and revisiting that. It truly is. Because you'll just gap fill a, a hole in your foundation. Um, and then uh, subscribe to the Market Sniper channel and the Crypto Sniper channel. Very, very busy uh, channels analyzing the crypto markets and the traditional markets. The Reset Sniper is about politics, economics, and who's behind the game. So that's a more acquired taste. If you want that, it's there. Um, yeah. And then on our website, themarketsniper.com, there's a book a call or get started button uh, that costs absolutely nothing to have a chat. We don't have any salesmen. All my people that answer the phone are people that purchased a course themselves and are traders and in our community. In other words, there are people that thought, should I be doing this? This is a lot of money. Yeah. So you can book a call, cost nothing. If it doesn't suit you, you don't come on board. We're grateful to hear from you anyway. Thank you so much for uh, getting in touch. And it's nice. I've really enjoyed yeah, the chat. Yeah, me too, Francis. Thanks a lot. All the best. Bye-bye. If you're still with us and want to find out more about Francis's various training programs, check out his YouTube channels for The Market Sniper, The Crypto Sniper, and The Reset Sniper. I'm Nicholas Penrake, and you've been listening to A Trader's Life.